everybody. Uh, so f first of all, of course, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Federa and Monica for the invitation uh, uh, and the NCCR as a whole. Uh, I don't get to think and talk about these kind of aspects of my, my life uh, so much, so uh, I'm going to try to convene something to you. It's a purely personal opinion and personal story, so don't take it as an advice, but you know, maybe just as a, maybe an inspiration or, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, it's very unfortunate that I couldn't attend yesterday because I think I would have learned much more from the people speaking than, than what I can teach you today. Uh, and I've seen a, a really interesting lineup and, and very interesting uh, people uh, giving probably uh, the same kind of stories, but I think it's good to have as many uh, anecdotal stories uh, to make a, a decent choice when you're facing that choice. Um, I have to catch a plane uh, after that, so I'm afraid I won't stay very long. But uh, in the last slide, I have my email and my Twitter account, so please contact me. I'm very happy to meet people, uh, have a conversation, a coffee later uh, uh, in the next uh, weeks or years uh, if, you, if you think uh, I can help in any way. Uh, so my name is Luc Henry. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm, so my current job is a, I'm a scientific advisor to the president of EPFR. I'm not going to give too much detail about the different jobs I had. Uh, again, if you want to come up with questions afterwards, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, I was trying to think of a way to explain how I ended up in this, these jobs rather than explain to you what the jobs are. Um, and I find it funny that I was in this alternative career session because uh, I, I don't know what a career is and I don't know if mine is alternative or it's just very unusual. Uh, I don't think of it as a career, and I, you know, I'm, I'm asking myself the same questions as probably all of you. Uh, when somebody asks me, where do you see yourself in five years, I mostly give this answer, I have no idea. Uh, um, but I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, so today I have four main activities. I'm not going to call them jobs or, or however. Uh, so this one at EPFL is basically taking me about 80% of my time, which in reality is probably 100 and 120. But officially, I'm, I'm four days on that job. And that gives me the flexibility to have one day a week to do whatever I want. So uh, I end up working on weekends. But one day a week, I can say, oh, I'm not there because I'm not paid by EPFL. So I can, I can do something else, like, like come here, for example. Uh, the second uh, activity is. Um, I founded uh, the Science Booster, so it's a crowdfunding platform for uh, research projects uh, in partnership with a crowdfunding uh, company in uh, Zurich, in Switzerland. And what we're trying to do is to uh, um, convince scientists and researchers that uh, crowdfunding is an interesting way, not, not so much to raise funding, but to communicate about the science they do with people they would not necessarily um, speak to uh, traditionally. Uh, then. Uh, I, I am a freelance journalist as well, so I write regularly for different outlets, uh, again, mostly in my free time, and then I have founded an association, which I'll maybe tell you more about later. So this is um, my life in a slide. I thought it was an interesting exercise to, to do that. I had to present this a couple of weeks ago, so I'm reasoning this. And I tried to categorize what I've done. I mean, this is just a subset, but uh, into research. So I've, I've had a traditional research career until uh, 2014. Um, mostly full-time, and then um, I, I have this category of editorial, so that's basically where I'm interested in, in content, in information content, and how I can bring uh, scientific information to people, and then the policy, so really thinking about the system, you know, uh, why do we do things this way, and uh, uh, what would be interesting uh, innovation uh, to bring to the way we do science rather than to the science itself. Uh, and thinking about what drives people in a, in a career, uh, I think they're really two things. Um, and they are the same, or they look the same, but they're not. Uh, so I think um, you do things because you have to uh, in, in a career perspective, which is you know people expect you to give that answer in a job interview, or people expect you to do this, or to get that kind of training to reach that position. Uh, so that's one way to consider a career, and I'm not judging, I'm giving my, my uh, opinion about it. Uh, it's, it's probably a very efficient way to get somewhere if you know where you're going. So, you know, there are steps you need to take, and you can ask for advice which steps to take and how to do it best, and uh, eventually you'll get there. 
Um, and then you have the things you have to do because you have to do them. And, and this is the passion that drives you. And I'm, I'm more driven in my career uh, or in my non-career by, by the passion than the things like the, the traditional uh, sort of expected uh, steps. Uh, I'm going to take a look at my notes. Yeah, and sorry, to go back to this, um, basically I think a job is something that pays and something you do uh, uh, because you need to survive. And there are hobbies that you do because you have the passion. And hopefully you have the passion in both your jobs and your hobbies. But uh, um, I'll focus on the hobby because uh, I think all of my hobbies in the past have led me to my next job. Uh, and, uh, and I want to show you that uh, sometimes it's good to invest into what you really love and ignore maybe your job for a while. And, and because that would be the, the, the trigger for the next uh, step in your career. So, uh, I, as you saw, I had this traditional education. I went abroad. I think now it's getting more popular uh, with the European Union Erasmus programs. And I mean, people do move around, which is you know, not so unusual in my case anymore. Um, uh, so, I had a very good experience abroad during my studies. And then at the end of it, I was looking for a place to do my master's thesis. And so, I emailed 20 people, 20 labs around Europe. And uh, I basically got two answers, one from Germany and one from the UK. And I had to make a choice uh, between uh, one and the other. And um, I'll take you through a few digressions in my, in my career, uh, why I made a choice and mostly why they were not really uh, maybe expected choices. So I had this choice between the, the, the UK and Germany and I picked the UK because the city in which uh, the position was is also the city where maybe some of you are fans like me, uh, Radiohead was born. So it's, I mean, to me, is they're one of the most creative artists on the planet. And I thought, okay, if I go there, uh, I'll probably end up meeting them, you know? Uh, it would be fun, or maybe a, a small private gig or something like this. Um, fortunately for me, it happens that they come from Oxford, which has a pretty good university as well. So um, I went there for my, for my research, and uh, I did end up meeting most of the band's uh, members uh, in the future, but you know, I have nothing to do with my, with my career there. So uh, I'm not a musician, not so much. So um, after these nine months in Oxford on my master's thesis, I came back with an application uh, running to come back for a PhD. So I was convinced that it was a place where I wanted to live, and I was convinced that they were doing, uh, obviously, excellent research, and I wanted to, to, to become a researcher and go back there. Um, and, and here comes the second digression in my career. Uh, so I was, I was waiting for the answer for this uh, 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 um, scholarship application, and uh, my best friend and I had been thinking about traveling the world on a bicycle for about five years, and every time we had time to do it, uh, some circumstances made, made us you know, give up the project. So I had this dream of, of leaving. And at this point, basically, at the same time I got the positive answer from Oxford, uh, we had uh, an opportunity to go. And I had to make a choice. And um, so I started asking for advice around me, you know, uh, should, I, should I take the scholarship or should I, should I go and, and fulfill my dream? And a lot of people, uh, told me, oh, you know, it's a one in a lifetime career opportunity, you should really take that scholarship. Except for one single person who was my uh, boss at the time, uh, I, I don't think she's here, but Gizu van der Goot, she's the, the Dean of Life Science at EBFR and a member of the NCCR uh, network. And she told me, no, Luke, you should really uh, live your dream, uh, opportunities come uh, again. So what I did, uh, because uh, I guess I didn't want to give up entirely, I asked for the scholarship to be postponed, and they told me, well, listen, uh, we don't know, we don't usually do that. Um, but uh, welcome back to you. And it took them like four months to come back to me. I was already cycling across the world at the time. Uh, but the lesson I learned is uh, be bold. Don't, don't, don't you know, uh, be scared to ask for something when you think it's really important. And, and I do it systematically now. I think I want a part-time job so that I have time to do other things. And every time I go in a job interview, I say, can I have a part-time job? And if they say no, well, you know, you can always rethink your objectives, but I think it's important that if you, there's something you really want to do, and in particular a dream, even though it has nothing to do with your job, um, make it a priority and make sure you actually take the opportunity when it, when it comes. Um, maybe as a side note, uh, I'm, re I'm reading this right now and I thought it would be maybe interesting. Um, so Max Weber, 
uh, wrote, uh, I mean, gave a lecture in 1919 in, in Berlin where he talks about science career. It's called uh, Science as a Vocation. Uh, you find the text online or you can download the PDF, so, so have a look, uh, very interesting. And he talks about specialization, and I always had this sort of schizophrenic position where uh, I would spend three years on a PhD uh, getting specialized, and that's what mostly academia expects from you, and then I had all these uh, hobbies and passions that I wanted to explore. Um, and um, I'm, I mean, I, we can debate this, I'm not convinced by his argument, but basically what he says is, uh, if you want to become a scientist, you need to be driven by science and science only, and you have to not be able to sleep if you don't know if the answer you're ready to give to the world is 100% accurate. And uh, it's beautiful, I think, but, uh, but somehow uh, I find it difficult to, to, ad to adopt this kind of mentality. Um, where am I now? There we go. And um, so that brings me to my third digression, because by the time I came back from Oxford, I had a, a research position here in Switzerland. And um, I was interested in, in the context of doing science. You know, why do we do science uh, one way and not another? Uh, what are the norms that we follow without really thinking about it? And uh, I think at this point, I realized that I was mostly interested in questioning the status quo and trying to make the, the context in which I work evolve in a direction that I would think uh, is, is more interesting, more productive. Um, so I started this, uh, this uh, association, which is also a, a physical space called Aquarium. Um, I'm not going to give too much detail, you can check the website, but uh, it's basically a place where we try to do science, uh, not so much as successful as, as people in academia, but in a very different way, and mostly we do it by having uh, people with profiles that don't fit the traditional scientific careers. And it's been very interesting to see uh, who are these people that are interested in science but don't have the background, how can we help as scientists, you know, maybe achieve some of their goals and what kind of projects, innovation, ideas come out of this and how they evolve. Uh, and uh, I myself actually ended up working on a music project with uh, a couple of people, which has been uh, very interesting because I also had to learn how musicians work and, and that gives me you know, a lot of insights into a different career path. Um, the fourth digression also came during my, my uh, postdocs. Um, in Oxford I met uh, a friend who became the editor of a, a web platform writing about science, and uh, he asked me to start writing for him. So I, I got into journalism basically by just uh, helping a friend build his, his platform. I didn't know anything about journalism or writing uh, popular science, but um, because of this um, job that I did for free, uh, I got exposed to editors who would correct my work, and, and you know, so I learned by doing, if you wish, and uh, by the end of my second contract in research, um, again by chance I was in a party <laughs> uh, uh, discussing uh, with uh, the boss of a company that does publishing, and they told me, oh, you know, the chief editor of this magazine just left. Uh, we see you're a scientist and you have experience in journalism, why don't you take over his position? So basically uh, I said, okay, well, I just had a drink, so maybe I'll come back next week and, and discuss more seriously. But I ended up a year leading this magazine. Uh, it's uh, translated in three languages, uh, German, French, and English. And uh, it's been a fantastic experience uh, learning to do project management and, and learning the skills of, of being an editor and a journalist at the same time because I was writing a lot of the, the content there. So that brings us back to uh, my first slide, and um, maybe it makes more sense now. Uh, some people say, oh, you know, it's very coherent, your career, I think you have a, you have a vision. Uh, I don't know, sometimes I ask myself, you know, is, are all these activities really leading somewhere? Uh, do they make sense? Uh, but, but again, I think um, the constant is really, okay, we have, there's a world around us, um, and um, I'm, I'm keen on questioning how it works. As a scientist, obviously, I'm running experiments to gain insights into uh, molecular biology or proteins or whatever, like I did uh, before. Uh, in, in the science policy or in the communication, I'm basically using the same tools, these same experimental tools to test new ideas and, and, and try things and see how people respond and if they like it or if it's relevant and then uh, draw conclusions from these experiments. So most of what I've done was very experimental. Now, 
my current job, and is it a yet another digression? I don't know. Uh, but um, because of these activities, both as communicator and as innovator in the way science is done, now I'm advising the president of EPFL on what should be the innovation that EPFL should adopt in their research practices. Because the world is changing, it's changing really fast these days, and um, we need to innovate in the way science is done. And uh, my role is really to look around, see what are the emergence uh, um, new practices in academia, and try to analyze them and uh, advise you know, an institution on whether they should adopt these new practices or ignore them because they're not relevant. So um, I didn't end up there by chance. I think my, my uh, experience working with communities at the, at the fringe between science and, and society uh, led me to be interested in innovation in the way science is done, and I think that's, that's why I ended up in, in this job now. Um, one thing, one last thing is really, um, when you are trained as a chemist, like I was, and you end up doing science policy, very often I think, oh, am I really qualified? You know, am I really the person who should be doing this job? And then I read uh, Pierre Bourdieu, who's being very cynical about people uh, doing science policy, uh, that he calls, you know, science of science. And uh, he says, you know, mostly the people doing this are people who failed at, as, uh, at being good scientists, and they're just frustrated, and they just want to, uh, to uh, uh, they have this, uh, what do they say, uh, half, they are these half-baked scientists, he called them. And, uh, and uh, the more I think about it, the more I think, uh, no, this is not true. I think you can perfectly uh, be a good scientist, but decide to, you know, challenge uh, the status quo and, and make the world in which you live evolve in a direction that you think is, is better. Uh, and uh, so this is hopefully what I do today. So thank you very much. Uh, please contact me. I'll be around for the next uh, half hour. And uh, otherwise, by email or anything, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you.